The sun was sinking below the trees when they reached their destination, a small clearing in the depth of the wood where nine weirwoods grew in a rough circle. John drew in a breath, and he saw Sam Tarley staring. Even in the wolf's wood, you never found more than two or three of the white trees growing together. A grove of nine was unheard of. The forest floor was carpeted with fallen leaves, blood red on top, black rot beneath. The wide, smooth trunks were bone pale, and nine faces stared inward. The dried sap that crusted in the eyes was red and hard as ruby. Bone Marsh commanded them to leave their horses outside the circle. This is a sacred place. We will not defile it. When they entered the grove, Samuel Tarley turned slowly, looking at each face in turn. No two were quite alike. They're watching us, he whispered. The old gods. When the winds of winter finally does come out, and please, let's keep the faith for old George, he needs our support. When it does come out, it's going to be kind of like Sir Ilian Payne walking into the room, unsheathing his great broadsword. The thing will go silent, at least for our beloved fan theories. That's right, when winter comes, they will die like flies. Except for a few special theories, which got something right, and right now, I've got that special feeling. Because the new 2024 A Song of Ice and Fire calendar art by Justin Sweet seems to be confirming one of my oldest and most cherished theories of the story. That the current form of the weirwood trees that we see in the story is altered and perverted from its original form. That's right, the bleeding, silently screaming tree faces that seem so cool in the story but would, would probably be really unsettling in real life. And actually, Bran is unsettled by the heart tree in the beginning of the story. Well, they, they haven't always looked like that. As it stands now, they don't look happy. And if they've been altered or perverted against their will from their original form, then they probably aren't happy. I've actually compared them to the Whites, which have effectively had their brains scooped out. And in fact, I am pretty sure that George is doing an intentional white tree, white tree wordplay. W-I-G-H-T, W-H-I-T-E. Because these look very much to me like zombie trees. Bone white bark, blood red leaves, and a vacant, screaming face, weeping and gurgling blood. And like the whites, the white trees aren't in control of their own person or tree person, being instead inhabited by and controlled by a foreign intelligence. But apparently, it wasn't always this way. They used to be green and not covered in blood. This is a huge revelation of world building, and I'm going to make the case today that it has direct implications for the end of the story and the resolution of the ancient feud with the White Walkers. The weirwood trees, of course, are the backbone of magic in Westeros, and maybe the world if those roots go all the way down to the core of the planet, which they might. And if the entire weirwood tree network was, in some sense, altered, disfigured, or even hollowed out sometime in the ancient past, then surely this must have something to do with Bran's ultimate purpose as a green seer, and probably something to do with the creation of the White Walkers, which seems to be linked to the Weirwoods and Weirwood magic, and some act of original sin that must be atoned for by the end of the story. To put it simply, myself and a few others have long believed that that original sin was the desecration, defilement, and alteration of the Weirwood Net, and that this act did indeed create the White Walkers. And the new revelation about what I believe to be the original form of the Weirwoods adds new strength and some amount of clarity to this theory, as well as inviting some pretty fun new speculation. Now, I, for one, have always been kind of a stick in the mud about insisting that the bloody face carving, blood sacrifice to heart trees, and Jojen paste cannibalism that we see in the story was not the original form of weirwood magical practice, but is instead an altered form that arose after this defilement of the weirwood net. And in this video, I'll explain why I think that, what I think those original practices might have been, and what that might mean for the story. Most of all, I'll explain what it means for the weirwood trees to have once been green, and what happened to them to make them appear as they do now. That will naturally lead us to several conclusions about what must be done to solve the issue of the White Walkers and the Long Night that is pretty definitely coming back in the Winds of Winter. So settle in and enjoy Secret Origins of the Green Men Part 4, The Green Weirwoods. Boy, Howland made it look so easy the first time. How do I... Oh, hello! It's... Reading Rhaegar, unsuccessfully making rose crowns, here on the Isle of Faces, which 
Turns out to be very close to David Lightbringer's apartment, where I live. Now that the secret is out about me and Leanna getting married here on the Isle of Faces before the old gods, I wanted to tell you how it is that I got myself into this position. And the answer is rocket money. That's right, nothing impresses the ladies or well, the gentlemen, I see you, John Connington, more than someone who has their personal finances in order. And Rocket Money is just the app you need to lower your monthly bills, cancel your unwanted subscriptions, and manage your money better. <laughs> and you thought I impressed Leanna with songs and prophecy and webs of dream. No, sir, it was the fact that I had eliminated all my unwanted subscriptions that used to haunt me like the ghosts of Summerhall. Leanna herself took one look at the Rocket Money app, and it changed her life. Hmm, yes, it looks like you're subscribed to uh, Robert Baratheon. Robert Baratheon? Oh, Ned signed me up for that. He loves that service. So it's a cancel? Definitely a cancel. So there you have it, folks. Set yourself free with the Rocket Money personal finance app. Take control of your budgets, lower your monthly bills, and cancel those unwanted subscription ghosts. And if planning for the future is your thing, like me, I'm always planning for the future, you can open a Rocket Money smart savings account. Try Rocket Money today for free, for free, at rocketmoney.com slash lightbringer. And now, if you'll excuse me, I've got some talking tree faces to consult with. Hey guys, David Lightbringer here. Man, those ads keep getting better every time. Thanks for watching that, appreciate it. So first of all, we're talking about this piece of artwork right here by Justin Sweet, which appears to show Rhaegar and Lyanna on the Isle of Faces. And full disclosure, I did use the Photoshop clone tool to make a version of the scene without Rhaegar and Lyanna for the thumbnail image, since they're so fabulous and distracting. But I do want to be super clear that this is the original, and this one on the right, without them, is the modified version. Big thanks to Justin, who obviously knocked it out of the park with this year's calendar. Look at that cold hands artwork. And how about this Sandor Clegane? And don't blame Justin if the weirwood bark looks funky in that one spot. But anyway, obviously, if you're an artist commissioned to do in a Song of Ice and Fire calendar artwork, you don't go freelancing something like Rhaegar and Lyanna chilling next to a weirwood tree on the Isle of Faces. And that is, again, because George R.R. R. Martin directs this artwork. So it is canon. This is a real thing that happened. And yeah, there they are. Lyanna and Rhaegar sitting in a tree. Literally. And we can infer that this is the Isle of Faces because it's really the only god's wood that Rhaegar and Lyanna could be hanging out in peacefully, considering the entire realm was looking for them once they absconded together. We can also infer that this must be the Isle of Faces because we've never seen a weirwood tree that looks like this. And where else would there be some different kind of weirwood tree secreted away but the Isle of Faces? Take a look. The face isn't bleeding, and there are no blood red leaves to be seen anywhere, as opposed to all the godswoods we've seen in the books and the weirwood grove of nine that we heard in the opening quote, which are always carpeted in fallen red leaves. These leaves are green, though, and again, that face is not bleeding. I somehow didn't notice this myself, full confession, so I want to give a huge shout out to Crow Food's daughter, one of my favorite YouTubers, longtime friend of the Disputed Lands YouTube channel. And also, brand new YouTuber and smash hit on the scene, Michael Talks About Stuff, of the YouTube channel of the same name. Michael Talks About Stuff. I've linked to their videos below, and I recommend giving them a watch, but yeah, they both pointed out that this looks like an unblooded, green-leaved weirwood tree, which it sure does. And now we recall that in the first A Game of Thrones chapter in the Winterfell Godswood, the old gods of the weirwood are actually referred to as the nameless, faceless gods of the greenwood. That turns out to be not just a vague allusion to the green of nature, but to the original green weirwood trees, which the first green seers used. Those green seers were, quite literally, the gods of the green wood. Okay, so the wood is white, the leaves are green. Close enough. Now, as to those leaves, Crowfood's daughter also had the brilliant insight that the original form of the weirwood tree must have had leaves like green hands, instead of leaves like bloody red hands as they have now. Since so much ink is spilled about how Garth Greenhand had green hands and planted weirwoods. Garth Greenhand is, of course, described exactly like a green man. Green hair, green skin, antlers like a stag. And the sacred order of green men guard the weirwood trees on the Isle of Faces, which we can see now have green leaves. You can't quite tell from the picture what the shape of those leaves are, but I do think Crowfood's daughter is correct and that we can assume that those would be green hand leaves instead of red hand leaves. They just changed color, not shape. So these are two entirely parallel stories, linking green men 
green hands, and weirwood trees. The green men on the Isle of Faces watch over special weirwood trees with green hand leaves, and Garth Greenhand is basically a green man planting weirwoods in Highgarden, and who appears to be named after the original green-leaved weirwoods. Garth Greenhand is also said to have fathered all of the oldest houses in the Reach, and these descended houses of his then turned around and created a sacred order of knights called Knights of the Green Hand, and that's a title that they bestow on many of their most prestigious warriors. This obviously seems like a human tradition intended to parallel the more magical, sacred order of the green men over on the Isle of Faces, and these Knights of the Green Hand in the Reach take their name, obviously, from Garth Greenhand. Now, Garth himself is thought of as either the leader of the first First Men in Westeros, or as someone who was there in Westeros before the First Men. So his mythology is about as old as anything gets in Westeros. It seems likely to me that Garth the Green, as a mythical figure, simply represents the Green Men, who at times were the leaders of the First Men, and who were perhaps in Westeros before the First Men. And it seems that all of this Garth culture, built upon the concept of Green Hands, is actually derived not from Garth himself, but from the original form of the weirwood trees, which had leaves like green hands instead of red. The idea of Garth taking his name from the weirwood trees tells us that green men aren't just associated with weirwood trees. They don't just guard them. Instead, they must be entirely joined at the hip at some sort of symbiotic relationship, such as exists between a dryad and its home tree. It's fantasy elf stuff. This is something that's always seemed true to us mythical astronomy folks, based on the meanings of the word Garth. On one hand, the word Garth is interchangeable with the word weir when applied to a wooden fishing trap built out to over a river, which can either be called a fishing weir or a fish Garth. That means that weirwood trees are actually Garthwood trees. Or alternately, we can call Garth Greenhand weir Greenhand, which, yes, he does, and yes, they do. The word Garth can also apply to a cloister garden inside a monastery or a castle. A godswood by another name, as you can see from these pictures. Thus, a godswood is actually a Garth garden, and in the middle of these Garth gardens, we find a Garthwood tree. Garth Greenhand, or Weir Greenhand himself, planted three Weirwoods in the High Garden Godswood. And then he founded a line of Gardener Kings who were named Garth Gardener, one, two, three, and so on. They're called Gardener Kings because that is their duty and the source of their kingship. It all revolves around tending the magical gardens with the Garth trees. Ergo, the revelation that the original form of the Weirwoods is a non-bloody tree with green hand leaves that Garth Greenhand was probably named after, well, it just fits right in and really completes the picture. It tells us that at some point, before this original sin that made the Weirwoods bleed, we had some sort of older culture where first men built their castles around these trees and named these green men as their kings, or even god kings. Since Garth is said to be both a god in some stories and also a high king of the first men in others. Nowadays, the green-leaved weirwoods are only found on the Isle of Faces, but the fact that we find all of this green hand folklore in the Reach tells us that the green hand weirwood trees were once found elsewhere. Which makes sense if this is indeed the original form of the weirwoods. And it it's in fact evidence that that is the case. What were these green men exactly? Were they really green-skinned, Cernunos-like taller elf beings? Some sort of cousins of the children of the forest? That's what I'm hoping for, and if you'd like a Garth the Green t-shirt, check out the bonfire link below the video. But we do have to question the idea of him having green skin now. That could be a notion that evolved over time, from the idea of him having green hands, which of course refers to the green leaves of the weirwood trees, that they used for magic, and not necessarily the skin of the green man. Although certainly the green man might actually have green skin. That's definitely in play. And of course, more importantly, if the green men are green seers, as one would presume, then they are wearing the trees like a skin anyways, and thus have green hands. In fact, the classic folkloric idea of the green man as a stag man who is some sort of guardian of the forest is partly based on the visual similarity. The stag antlers on his head look like the branches of a tree, making Sir Nunos and all his ilk look a bit like walking trees. So a weirwood tree, or a garth wood as it were, is kind of like a giant green man planted in the ground, one that has green hands. Nowadays, the green seers who wear the skins of the weirwood trees sit in root thrones in the caves below. So perhaps the green men, the original green seers, did this too. But that might not be the case based on the 
curious legend of the Oaken Seat. The Oaken Seat was supposedly a living throne that grew from an oak that Garth Greenhand himself had planted for his descendants, the Gardener Kings, to rule from. But now that we know that the Weirwoods used to have green leaves, we do have to wonder if this was really a living oak throne or perhaps a living Weirwood throne that just got later remembered as an oak tree because it didn't have any blood or blood red leaves. That's my guess anyway, because if the Weirwoods used to be green, then magical oak trees seem kind of redundant. If Garth is a green man who can plant Weirwood trees and use Weirwood magic, then why would he make a throne of a living oak tree? We know that Weirwood thrones are a thing, so why wouldn't he make a throne of a living Weirwood? Well, maybe he did. And even if he didn't, it's still a living tree throne that is not said to be in a cave, and that would be interesting all on its own. In either scenario, we're left with the idea that tree thrones don't have to be underground. And so perhaps the original Green Man Green Seers didn't live underground in caves full of bones. And maybe they didn't have to eat their friend's brains scrambled up into a pasty porridge to activate their gift and wed the trees. These green men seem like they would naturally be wedded or joined, like I said, in a symbiotic relationship to these green hand weirwood trees. Whereas humans have to create that connection with the brain eating. Check out my Jojen paste video. It's, it's true, it's, it's canon. Bran ate his friend's brain scrambled into a paste in a little wooden bowl and and it gave him magic. And by the way, have you ever wondered just how much stuff in A Song of Ice and Fire would sound like stuff that Florida Man would get arrested for if you just took out the magic? A Florida Man was arrested after eating his friend's brains, declaring it would help him wed the trees. The judge has denied bail. Or Florida Man, known to locals as the Marsh King, eaten alive by alligators while attempting to ride on their backs and so on. Florida Man dies from drinking liquid napalm. Aha, <laughs> bet you didn't know Aryan Bright Flame was Florida Man. So yes, the idea that the Weirwoods used to be unbloodied directly implies that the macabre form of green seeing that we see now is an altered form of the original practice and quite possibly some grisly attempt to recreate or regain what was lost. So much blood. The trees bleed and drink blood, and Bran and the other green seers can taste that blood, indicating that they're drawing strength and vitality from those sacrificial offerings to the trees. Bran might be drinking his ancestors' blood, but don't think about that. The bloody face carving, the Jojen paste brain eating, the rotting but still living corpse that Bloodraven has become, and the way the roots are penetrating and consuming his body. It's all just as macabre and horrific as you could be, or as George R. R. Martin could make it. And in a fantasy story, this is generally the kind of thing that has a clever explanation behind it. I've always been skeptical that this is how it's always worked, that these were all the natural practices of the children of the forest. I mean, it just doesn't seem very fantasy elvish. Now that we know that the Weirwoods weren't originally bleeding and didn't always have leaves like bloody hands, it seems likely that the original Weirwood practices were also different and perhaps did not revolve around blood magic. I mean, I always thought that communing with trees involved mushrooms and quiet reflection and not brain eating, but hey, what do I know? Now, the symbolism of this weirwood transformation is profound. At a basic level, we can say that the trees are bleeding because they've been wounded. And not only are they crying blood, but consider the wordplay of the phrase red smile in A Song of Ice and Fire. When someone's throat is cut, it's said that they've been given a red smile. And the weirwoods literally have a bleeding red smile which has been carved with a knife, or which at least appears to have been. The weirwoods, like a human sacrifice with a slashed throat, are drowning in their own blood, as well as the blood of all those sacrificed to them. You could almost think about them as being like vampire trees, which have been bitten and transformed, and now must drink blood and consume blood to stay alive, or half unalive, I don't know what you call it. Now, the green man of classic world folklore represents the green vitality of nature. And basically every version of this myth involves the idea of sacrificing the green man as a representation of the turning of the cycle of the seasons. The green man dies in the fall or the winter as a depiction of nature losing its green in the winter, and then he's reborn in the spring. Even the mythology of Garth himself works just this way. A few of the very oldest tales of Garth Greenhand present us with a considerably darker deity, one who demanded blood sacrifice from his worshippers to ensure a bountiful harvest. In some stories, the green god dies every autumn when the trees lose their leaves, only to be reborn with the coming of spring. This version of Garth is largely forgotten. 
So the first part, the idea of sacrificing people to Garth, surely comes from the blood magic tradition of sacrificing people to heart trees. A tradition which we know did arise at some point very long in the past, even if it wasn't the original thing. Now the second idea, the yearly sacrifice and rebirth of the Green Man as a depiction of the cycle of the seasons, is basically the core of what Green Man myth is about. So now, consider the appearance of the bloodied weirwood tree. It's a depiction of a green man perpetually stuck in that moment of sacrifice, unable to be reborn anew. That's not a good omen, as they say. It's very much parallel to the idea of a winter without end, where spring never returns. And thus you can see how the cycle of the seasons actually frames the entire magical backstory of A Song of Ice and Fire. These green man trees are frozen and stuck in the dying phase, just as the world is frozen and stuck on winter when the long night falls. Perhaps this is part of what Martin means when he twice refers to the weirwoods as pale giants frozen in time. Even the red weirwood leaves at a basic level remind us of a tree in the fall, right? When most green tree leaves turn orange and red and brown as they die. All of this implies that getting the world unstuck from the long night that is to come in the winds of winter might involve some sort of healing or restoration of the weirwood net, which would be akin to the rebirth of the green man. In his video on the topic, Michael talks about stuff, talks about these green weirwoods on the Isle of Faces as a kind of repository or seed vault a preservation of the original form from which a restoration can be initiated. That's obviously a compelling idea, and I think it will turn out to be true in some form or another. I think the Isle of Faces will be the key to healing or restoring the weirwood net, if such a thing is to occur, which I think it is. And of course, now it makes a great deal of sense that there are green men on the Isle of Faces guarding these unique green-leaved weirwood trees. They pretty much won't let anyone land on the island, so there must be something special about these weirwood trees, and obviously there is. It makes sense that it's more than just making sure, you know, a bunch of weirwoods don't get cut down, because there are actually weirwoods all over Westeros. They grow wild in places like Sea Dragon Point, the Wolf's Wood, Cracklaw Point, the Rain's Wood, and of course everywhere north of the Wall. And they can be found in God's Woods all across Westeros. At least until Melisandre shows up. She burned the one at Storm's End. The weirwoods on the Isle of Faces are different though, and somehow they seem to have either survived the corrupting event or to have been restored, and I'd guess it's probably the former. One thing's for sure, and that's that the odds of Bran Stark visiting the Isle of Faces before the end of the story seem very, very high. All right, well, ironically, in a video about the Weirwoods losing their green, I have lost use of my colored light, and so we're doing an earth tone thing. Sorry about the inconsistency. I threw on earth tone shirts, so it just kind of makes sense, you know? Trees rooted in the earth. We're rolling with it because I didn't want to stop filming, so. I won't be stopped. I want to bring you the good news of Garth the Green. Praise Garth, everyone. Praise Garth. All right, so The Talking Heads, one of my favorite bands, and also possibly a thing in Westeros. And here's how we get there. So moving on from the idea of the green, non-bloody leaves, let's consider the idea of a weird face that doesn't bleed, because that's also a profound revelation. This suggests that the original weir faces may not have been carved since the blood sap that we see leaking from the modern weirwood faces leaks from the places where it has been cut and carved with a knife. That means we might be talking about actual magical tree faces, ones that are not carved but rather emerge from the wood on their own or as the result of some magic that we don't yet understand. Some people have picked up on the wordplay of weirwood as werewood, as in werewolf, with were meaning man here, so man tree, man wolf. And if the trees have actual living tree faces, then this idea is even more true. This may imply that the green men actually do transform into the green-handed weirwood trees somehow, just as the werewolf man transforms into a wolf. Or it could simply refer to the way that skin changers put on the skin of the tree and then take it off again and re-inhabit their human body. Whatever the case may be, we have seen one other non-bleeding weirwood face, and it is alive. And that, of course, would be the one that's off the tunnel that runs off the well shaft beneath the night fort. A turn or two later, Sam stopped suddenly. He was a quarter of the way around the well from Bran and Hodor, and six feet farther down, yet Bran could barely see him. He could see the door, though. The Black Gate, Sam had called it, but it wasn't black at all. It was white weirwood, and there was a face on it. A glow came from the wood like milk and moonlight. 
so faint it scarcely seemed to touch anything beyond the door itself. Not even Sam standing right before it. The face was old and pale, wrinkled and shrunken. It looks dead. Its mouth was closed, and its eyes. Its cheeks were sunken, its brow withered, its chin sagging. If a man could live for a thousand years and never die, but just grow older, his face might come to look like that. The door opened its eyes. They were white too, and blind. Who are you? The door asked, and the well whispered, Who, who, who? Well, this is certainly one of the weirder moments in A Song of Ice and Fire, especially the first time around. How did you like my talking tree voice? Of course, we actually shouldn't have been surprised to see an animated talking weir face, since we know that people, and perhaps children of the forest, have been carving faces on the weirwood trees for thousands of years. They had to get that idea from somewhere, right? Well, apparently the carvers of the heart tree faces got their idea from very real tree faces. And having seen this one here a good bit underground at the night fort, we have to wonder if the tree face in the trunks on the Isle of Faces green hand trees are the same sort of face. Meaning, are they alive? Can they open their eyes? And can they talk? This is really a huge question. If the original weirwoods could talk, then the religious practices suddenly make a lot more sense. The green seer spirits inside the tree, or perhaps in the caves below, could communicate directly to the people in the God's Woods gathered around the heart trees. And how much time could we have saved if Blood Raven could have just started explaining things to Ned Stark right at the beginning of the story, you know? <laughs> Wouldn't have had to arrange for Bran to get pushed out of a window. He could have just said, hey, send your son north so I can teach him how to be a green seer. And I guess there wouldn't have been much of a story, but you could see how efficient a system that would be. This idea also adds extra meaning to all the scenes where people are listening to the rustling of the leaves of the weirwood tree and thinking that they might be hearing the voice of the old gods. That's indeed how it used to work, perhaps. And Bran, on the other side of this broken form of communication, well, he wishes he could talk to the people in the gods' wood in front of his tree, and tries to, but can only make the leaves rustle. And maybe he whispered Theon's name that one time. It's hard to escape the feeling that we're seeing the remnants of a tradition that used to work quite well. Back in the day when the trees want to say a something, they just open up and talk. Now, despite the obvious difference of the Night Fort Weir face being well underground and the Isle of Faces ones being above ground in the trunks, I suspect that these are the same sort of tree face. On one hand, the Night Fort Weir face that talks and moves does not bleed, whereas all the other bleeding tree faces that we've seen do not talk and do not move. And therefore, I think we can conclude that the Night Fort tree face is not a carved tree face, but a living tree face, just as the Isle of Faces weir faces appear to be. Now, there does seem to be something special about the Night Fort weir face. I mean, it accepts the Night's Watch vows as a passcode and then opens its mouth to become a tunnel, which, of course, goes through the wall. And we've got no idea if the weir faces in the tree trunks on the Isle of Faces can open up and swallow people. But if they can, it would be a lot like the Norse myth of the last two people on Earth that survived Ragnarok surviving by hiding inside of a tree, which itself echoes the original Norse people creation myth of people being created from trees. So perhaps that's how the original green men hooked up to their green hand weirwood trees instead of living down in caves and weird thrones and having roots penetrate their body. Maybe the green hand tree faces just opened up and the green men just stepped inside, kind of like a woody mech suit or just a very cozy tree home to sleep in. And perhaps that's how the green hand trees are even given faces. Maybe they don't have faces at first, they open up, the green man goes inside, and then the face appears. Who knows? It does occur to me, though, that the bloody carved mouths, which sometimes contain the bones of human sacrifices, such as we see at the wildling village of White Tree, may be a sort of echo of the idea of the trees actually swallowing people. Green seers like Bran, specifically. Whether or not the Isle of Faces, Weir Faces can open up and swallow people, it does make a lot of sense that they'd be able to open their eyes and talk, for all the reasons I listed above. One thing is for certain, there is a lot to question regarding the legend of the signing of the pact between the First Men and the Children of the Forest on the Isle of Faces. So the gods might bear witness to the signing. Every tree on the island was given a face. And afterward, the sacred order of green men was formed to keep watch over the Isle of Faces. Most people have always imagined this as some sort of massive tree face carving event, right? But 
Now that seems wrong, because these Isle of Faces weir faces don't look carved. And they may well have always been there, if green weirwood trees naturally have faces on their trunks. Alternately, it could be that the green hand weirwoods are given faces in a way that isn't carving. Uh, something like the swallowing the green man theory that I just laid out above. Or maybe the green men are just buried waist deep in the dirt and then turn into trees. We can only speculate, and please do in the comments, but the main thing that I want to stress is that the carved bleeding faces that we see on most heart trees are not animate, while the non-bleeding tree face at the night fort is animate and does talk. And therefore, I tend to think that all the non-bleeding weir faces can talk and open their eyes. And that would make the Isle of Faces a very interesting place to visit indeed. I hope Rhaegar and Lyanna didn't R plus L equals J, you know, as the old gods looked on. That would be awkward. Nobody really wants their performance critiqued in real time, let alone by a tree. And then in all seriousness, the other thing I want to stress is that because the green hand culture is found in the reach, like I said, it implies that the green hand weirwood trees were once found in other places other than the Isle of Faces. This creates the scenario with talking weirwood trees you know, in the God's Woods of the First Man Castles. And that really is the scenario that I think explains the weirwood religious practices the best. All right, so some of you may be asking, why is there a talking animated weirwood face at the Night Fort when these green hand weirwood trees seem to only exist on the Isle of Faces now? Presumably because of some kind of protection magic that exists on the Isle of Faces. Well, for starters, the Night Fort is a very unique and mysterious place. It's the oldest castle on the wall, and in my opinion, predates the wall itself, since most of the first band castles are built around pre-existing weirwood trees. The Night Fort is tied to the legend of Knights, King, and Queen, which myself and many others believe to be about the creation of the others, despite the seeming timeline heresy involved. Don't be scared of timeline heresy, it's a good thing. And in fact, I actually have a recent theory about there having been a Green Man watch here at the Night Fort, similar to or exactly the same as the Sacred Order of Green Men on the Isle of Faces. And their duty would have been to watch over and interact with this very unique weirwood organism that exists at the Night Fort, which in my opinion includes the little trees sprouting up at the surface as well as the talking weirwood face down below, because as we've seen in Blood Raven's Cave, the roots go down and down and down. They almost seem to get thicker as they go down, so the weirwood is a mushroom-like organism. Most of it is underground. Hopefully you guys are familiar with this. Anyway, check out the video called The Green Men of the Night Fort for the full detail on that theory, but the crux of it is that I think there was a massive blood sacrifice event here with the sacrifice of these green men leading to the creation of the others, or in fact, being part of the creation of the others. I think the formation of the first Night's Watch here at the Night Fort would have been done to replace this original green man watch. And that, in my opinion, is why we hear about the first Night's Watch having been organized and aided by the children of the forest, and why the Night's Watch swear their oaths to the weirwood trees and the green seers inside of them, which all Night's Watchmen would have done before the arrival of the Andals. The Night's Watch is also supplied with dragon glass by the children of the forest, or used to be, and so in all ways we can see that the Sworn Brotherhood of the Night's Watch is an order initiated and shaped by the green seers, who were, in my opinion, trying to replace and reform the older green man sacred order that came before. That's also why the Lord Commanders of the Watch are frequently skin changers and green seers, and why there are abundant clues that the original Watchmen were all skin changers and green seers. So hopefully you're starting to see how the idea of talking green hand weirwood trees being guarded by a sacred order of green men works as an original template for what the Night's Watch and the Three-Eyed Crow are doing now. After the weirwood defilement event and the long night, everything seems to have changed. So everything had to be recreated with awful icky blood magic, right down to the last hero's 12 slain companions being resurrected to become the first undead Night's Watchmen. That's known as green zombie theory, by the way. It's one of my very oldest. And that's where this whole green men of the night fort theory got started. So the idea is simple. Cold Hands is an undead skin changer Night's Watchman, and Jon Snow is a dead skin changer Night's Watchman who's about to become an undead skin changer Night's Watchman. These types of rangers are basically ideal to roam the frozen dead lands and 
combat the others because they don't need to eat, sleep, or stay warm, as we've seen with Cold Hands. Now, I think we can know that Cold Hands is still a skin changer in possession of his skin changer magic because he rides a great elk, and that's something you need magic to do. And Cold Hands also communicates with the ravens. And also Jon Snow, again, is going to be resurrected and it'd be kind of lame if he lost all his magic. I don't think that's where this is going. What I think is happening is that Jon Snow and Cold Hands are showing us the original form of the Night's Watch. And it makes sense because, again, resurrected skin changers are ideally suited to take on the others. And I guess I neglected to mention the other part is that a skin changer, I think, makes a better zombie because their soul is more preserved inside their animal than somebody like Beric or Stoneheart, who only come back as sort of a shadowy remnant. We're all hoping for a better John Zombie, and I think we're going to get one. But flipping back to Cold Hands for a minute, he's basically coded, if you will, as an undead green man. His eternal duty seems to be to guard the haunted forest, just as the green man and Kernunos and all his ilk are always seen as guardians of the forest. And in fact, Cold Hands is modeled after a specific version of the green man called Hearn the Hunter, and Hearn the Hunter's legend is specifically called out by George in the form of two notable children of Garth the Green, who are called Herndon of the Horn and Harlan the Hunter. So Hearn the Hunter, Herndon of the Horn, Harlan the Hunter, and Hearn the Hunter has a horn. And those are Sam Tarley's ancestors, which makes this even cooler because Sam Tarley is a Night's Watchman, and he's the one, of course, who meets Cold Hands at the Night Fort. So in terms of mythical figures, Sam is kind of meeting his ancestor, here. Sam's ancestors are based on her and the hunter, and Cold Hands is based on her and the hunter. So very cool, very cool. And the most important thing is that it implies Cold Hands as an undead green man, because that's what Hearn the Hunter is. And then finally, of course, Cold Hands rides an elk, which is not only an indication that he's a skin changer, but that's specifically what the green men were said to do to ride great elk. So yeah, Cold Hands really does come across as an undead green man, and he may even be one. Stags, after all, lose their antlers in the winter, so maybe the green men lose their stag antlers when they go north and become undead. Or maybe the green men don't have antlers, they just have tree branch heads when they're inside the trees and they ride elk with antlers, perhaps. And then, as many of you have asked in the comments, yes, it's possible that green men could just refer to the original first men green seers and skin changers, and that there are no hybrid or new nose folk with antlers and green skin. So, whatever the truth about the green men is, <laughs> just keep your fingers crossed for real green men, I believe the cold hands is a clue about the original Night's Watchmen having been resurrected skin changers, just like cold hands. And cold hands could be one of the last hero's companions or the last hero himself. That is, that is possible. That would make him very, very lonely. That's a, that's a long 8,000 years, man. And by the way, we're going to do another Cold Hands stream soon, so make sure you subscribe to the channel and look out for that. I'm basically president of the Cold Hands slash Great Elk fan club and also a client. So yes, I believe the Night's Watch is a degraded and bloody form of what the Green Men did originally. Instead of living Green Men guarding talking green weirwood trees and taking guidance from them directly, the Night's Watch is made up of resurrected Green Men slash resurrected Green Seers and Skin Changers who swear their oaths to the Green Seers inside the degraded weirwoods, with the Watch receiving guidance from those Green Seers through less direct forms. The tree faces don't talk anymore, so now we use talking ravens, which doesn't work quite as well. They have a limited vocabulary. Corn? And then also they use a little bit of dream communication. We see Blood Raven communicating to Bran through dreams and possibly also to Jon Snow. The Green Men and the Night's Watch are both sacred orders which guard weirwood trees. At least if we think about the original Night's Watch, which would have been organized at the Night Fort, which again is built around this very unique weirwood organism with the talking tree face. And of course, both orders use green seeing magic. Most obviously, both orders are very invested in the return of spring. So I don't have time to sum up all the copious amounts of green zombie theory evidence, but basically all of it revolves around implying the Night's Watch as green men and skin changers, but also as the walking dead. So many of the names of the Watchmen imply them as green men, such as John Bartleycorn, Wad of the Woods, Harry Hal, Black Jack Bulwer, and the three, count them three Garths on the watch. Garth of Old Town, Garth Greyfeather, and the very interestingly titled Garth Greenaway. That's a name that would seem to refer to the green Garthwood trees, if you will. 
having had their green taken away. And then of course, as far as the undead symbolism, well, there's everything that Dolorous Ed says about still having to man the watch even after you're dead. There's the fact that the watch wears funeral black. They call themselves Black Shadows. They say that they bleed black blood. And of course, the whites of both ice and fire bleed black blood. And then, in my opinion, their Weirwood Grove vows simulate a resurrection ceremony where they kneel as, quote, green boys, but then rise again as men of the Night's nice Watch. The one who leads John in his oath is even the same person who kills him, Bowen Marsh, who is named after a marsh, a wetland, and his nickname, the Old Pomegranate, of course, ties him to Persephone, and thus to death and rebirth and the cycle of the seasons. Green Zombies Theory is pretty fun. It's got all the weird Santa Claus and Patchface stuff in there too, so check out the Green Zombies playlist for that. All right, so the big question, what happened? What's this dirty deed that defiled the Weirwood Net and created the White Walkers? Well, I've made a lot of videos about this topic, and there's a lot of different ways to come at the subject, but I just mentioned the idea of sacrificing green men at the Night Fort, so let's, let's try this angle. The Weirwood trees on the Isle of Faces are the only ones with the green hand leaves, and the only ones with unbloodied faces on their trunks, which we theorize to be not carved, but natural, magically naturally occurring. So what's unique about the Isle of Faces? Well, it has green men, of course. So what happened to the Weirwoods everywhere else? Well, the question we should be asking is what happened to the green men everywhere else? The ones who would have been tied to these Weirwood trees that weren't on the Isle of Faces. Where did those green men go? And <laughs> where did all these white walkers come from? That's right, I'm kind of laughing because it really is kind of simple. These bloody Weirwood trees with the disfigured faces that can't talk, the zombie-like white trees, well, they don't, they don't have their green men anymore. It's kind of like the green man has been ripped out of the Weirwood tree, ripped out of whatever symbiotic magical relationship existed between the green man and the green hand Weirwood. And then coincidentally, we have these white shadows, the white walkers of the wood, haunting the haunted forest. There are some sort of frozen spirits, which George Martin describes as icy ice she. And by the way, if you didn't know, the ice she are akin to fantasy elves in many ways, and they're absolutely part of the older folkloric roots of fantasy elves in general. In other words, and to put it simply, the white walkers are frozen spirits of the green men who have been cast out or evicted from their weirwood tree homes. And now those former tree homes exist in a fallen, sad, and bloody state that, again, looks makes them look like zombies who have had their souls and spirits hollowed out. And that's exactly what happened. So solutions, solutions. How do we fix this? Well, again, just to keep it simple here, the fandom has always suspected that there must be something more than just stabbing the White Walkers with magic weapons, which is why we found the TV show ending to be so unsatisfying. Although some amount of slaying them with magical weapons or melting them with dragon fire may be necessary until we could figure out how to solve the permanent problem. But the thing is, the Night's Watch did this the first time around. It says the others could not stand against the last hero's dragon steel, and obviously the first long night was ended somehow. And yet we still have White Walkers, and yet the, the long night is seemingly about to return. That means there's something else we gotta do, and based on what we've been talking about today, the logical conclusion seems to be we need to give them their tree homes back, right? This is another theory of mine that I've been talking about for a few years, and definitely other people have proposed something along these lines, because it's really the only conceivable answer other than stabbing them. If they are green man spirits ripped out of the weirwood trees, then that's probably why they're upset, and the only way to appease them would be to give them their homes back. And this is where weirwood net download theory comes in. That's right, the, the green-handed weirwood trees have got their hands all over some of the very best fandom theories. So Weirwood Net Download Theory, I think we saw some version of it on the show where Bran seemed to essentially download the entire memory of the Weirwoods into his little Bran brain over the course of two separate tree merging events. One in Blood Raven's cave and then the second sometime after Mira and Bran had safely escaped the walkers. I suspect the basic idea of Weirwood Net Download Theory would have been mentioned by George to the showrunners in one of their early planning meetings as a major part of the end game. Because it really just makes too much sense as a magical solution to all of this. 
Bran has to download the Weirwood Net, meaning the collective intelligence made up of all the green seers that have been living inside the Weirwood for all these centuries since the defilement incident, in order to vacate the premises and get it ready for the new occupants, who are the same as the original occupants. In this way, Bran will be removing the foreign intelligence from the Weirwood trees, and thus atoning for the original hollowing out of the Weirwood Net. In my opinion, the children of the forest and all the green seers before Bran, like Blood Raven, have essentially been babysitting a bad situation, waiting for Bran, the special chosen one, to come along and be capable of the Weirwood Net download, which again is the only solution to the White Walker problem. This in turn would make the King Bran ending, which we saw a version of on the show, make a lot more sense in the books. If Bran has the entire true history of Westeros in his brain, then you can picture him and Sam setting it all down and perhaps helping Westeros advance into the future. Perhaps transitioning from feudal monarchy into something more regional or shall we say democratic. Since Bran can't have children, he's kind of ideal to be the last king who ends the tradition of kingship, just as Bran would be the last green seer who puts an end to that tradition as well. Shutting down all the thrones at the end of Game of Thrones, you see. Hashtag no more thrones. So I don't know if it makes sense to imagine Bran ruling from the Isle of Faces as this incredible artwork by Ysilla depicts, since Bran wouldn't have a magical connection to the trees anymore, according to my thinking. But then again, maybe he would actually go back to the most original weirwood traditions and simply consult with the talking head tree faces on the green-leaved weirwoods on the Isle. Don't worry that they used to be the others, some of them. I'm sure they've got humans' best interest in mind and don't hold any grudges. So it's a democracy, but the House of Representatives is made up of the Lords of the First Men, and the Senate is made up of the Talking Trees. All right, so one final endgame theory to throw at you here. There may be a need for someone to lead the White Walkers back into the wood, or you might even say stuff them back into the trees. That someone or someones would be John and Danny, I'm pretty sure. Both of whom have symbolism that suggests they could become a kind of knight's king and queen, but not to lead an attack on Westeros. Plot twist, it would be to lead the White Walkers back into the Weirwoods, which I think would be kind of bittersweet. I explored this idea in a lot more detail in the videos Journey to the Heart of Winter, as well as Born to Burn the Others. And then there's also We Should Start Back, which is basically the ninth circle of hell slash 33rd Freemason degree of mythical astronomy videos. That one in particular left me with the impression that John was going to lead the White Walkers back into the trees. And I think that could also be the message of Danny's House of the Undying symbolism, which is in the Born to Burn the Others video. So there you go, folks. Hope you've enjoyed Secret Origins of the Green Men Part for the green weirwood trees as much as I did writing it. This has been a fun one. And again, if you want one of the cool Garth t-shirts, courtesy of artist Atlantis Morissette, then check out the link below the video to our bonfire store. And we've also got Reading Rhaegar shirts as well as David Lightbringer shirts with many more fun designs to come. Thanks for watching. Thanks for clicking like and subscribe. And I'll see you next time with more Song of Ice and Fire and House of the Dragon content.